The reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, to chapter 7, verse 1. And you can find this on page 1162 of the Church Bibles. Paul's Hardships. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distress, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonour, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and not yet killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Warning about idolatry. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean things, and I will receive you. And... I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of rever reverence for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So it's very clear that God has been teaching us as a church and as individuals what it means to triumph in trials, revealing to us by his spirit how we might apply those insights to our own lives. And I hope that uh, today will be another opportunity to receive whatever God has as gift for us this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as you bring your word to us by the power of your spirit, we pray we might be ready to receive and to act on those things which you have revealed to us in Jesus. Amen. 
So last week, I saw a film uh, which, uh, with my wife, we watched together, and it was the most amazing film. If you can get a chance to see it, please do. It's called The Rescue. And it, this little boy is one of 12 youngsters who you might remember in 2018 were trapped down a very deep cave system in northern Thailand along with their coach or a soccer team. And they just got completely stuck because the monsoon rains came early and the cave system was completely flooded. And they were huddling in this high part of the cave with nobody knowing where they were and no, nobody knowing how long they could survive. And Sean and I watched with amazement and suspense. And yet, of course, because it was a true story, we knew <laughs> how it would finish. We knew the end from the beginning. And those of you who will remember that story, which is all over the media, will have found the same. And it was a very different watch because of that. They, of course, didn't know how it would turn out. The people in Gaza don't know how it will turn out. The tiny number of Christians in Iran don't know how things will turn out. And as we face all kinds of trials in our lives, whether it be health or relationships or finance, whatever it might be, the question that this morning I want to focus on is how can we keep going? How can we persevere through it all? And what the passage that we've just heard read teaches us is that St. Paul had a particular perspective for persevering. He had a way of looking things that enabled him to persevere. Paul wants to remind us how much he and Timothy have been through in their mission to see people reconciled to God, as we were thinking about last week, and discover the kind of life that comes through having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You'll remember that at the start of his letter, Paul also listed a, a whole set of troubles or hardships which with the benefit of hindsight, he learned to see that this happened so that they might rely not on themselves, but on God. In verse, is chapter one, verse nine, the theme that runs, it is a theme that runs right the way through that letter. But here in chapter six, he comes at it again. Verses four and five describe some more. He describes his troubles and hardships distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. That's just for starters, it's quite a, a, a life that he's living, quite a lot to persevere through. But then Paul reveals how he can go through all this still relying on God. And it sums it up for me in a striking phrase which I've been living with since I read this passage a couple of weeks ago and pondering on. He says, we are people who are, have nothing and yet possess everything. Verse 10, having nothing yet possessing everything. It's a strange sort of phrase, isn't it? What does, what does that mean? Well, we will be... Uh, aware of those whose lives are profoundly sad and ache deeply within because they have everything and yet they possess nothing that really matters. And Paul is saying that he might have nothing in terms of whatever the world can offer, and yet he possesses 
everything that is of true value. Why? Because he has Christ. Because within his heart, he knows that his true identity is also a child of God. Come what may, therefore, nothing can change that. And this he describes earlier in this letter as having the most incredibly precious, invaluable treasure. At the beginning of chapter 4, he speaks about that treasure. <coughs> treasure which is ours, he says, in jars of clay. We are earthenware vessels and the treasure is within. Now Jesus speaks about treasure. Remember his parable of the, uh, the hidden treasure in Matthew 13, where he told one of the briefest parables I think he ever told. He just said, the kingdom of heaven, that is life, what, what life is like when God's in charge, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a person found it, they hid it again. And then in their joy, went and sold all that they had and bought that field. So that person, when he found this treasure, was so overwhelmed, was so filled with joy, that he went and sold all that he had, meaning that he had nothing, so that he might possess the everything that was this treasure. I wonder whether you experience something of that joy when the reality of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, lit up your lives. If you can remember that time, a profound sense of maybe exuberant joy. I remember jumping up in the air as I was going to some toilets on the way back from a great <laughs> event where I'd given my life to the Lord. And uh, yeah, crossing the road, I just crossed the road and jumped around and said, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't think there was any traffic coming, so it was all right. It was an exuberance. And yet there's another types of joy which is deeply, profoundly true, which knows that nothing can separate us from the love of God now. I'm a known, I'm known and I'm loved, I'm loved and I'm known for who I am. This is the joy that Jesus is describing in this parable of the man who found the treasure and just sold everything. In other words, he just, everything else just didn't matter in comparison with what this treasure was. He could let go of everything in order that he might receive that which God had for him. That divine exchange is the thing, that in the invitation to surrender all that we have and all that we are that we might receive all that God has and all that he is. It's moving from this closed, having, grabbing, owning things myself to letting that go with open hands to receive whatever God has for us in and through his son, Jesus. So what is this treasure? Well, there are so many, many jewels. But if you, I also want to focus on one. There's in the crown, for example, St. Edward, uh, not St. Edward's, King Edward's crown. Um, you can see it's full of jewels and we could preach hundreds of sermons on the different aspects of what it means to have a life in Christ. But overall, the crown is the thing that sums up all those jewels. And the one phrase, the life of Christ, is what sums up the treasure that God has given us. And it struck me, you know, that in Holy Communion, which we will be 
sharing shortly in this service. When we come to receive the bread of life, we're receiving the one who said, I am the bread of life. We're receiving the very life of Christ by faith. And we can't receive it if we come for communion and while our hands are all like this, we need to have hands that are open and ready to receive in vulnerability and love. And in fact, we'll hear those words, the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Because the life of Christ is eternal. The Greek word is zoe, which is about a quality of life that is unshakable, that is enduring, that is rich. Whoever eats this bread, said Jesus, shall never die again. This bread, his life, is the bread of heaven that feeds us till we want no more. And so that's why St. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, was able to write his letters to Christians in the area where he was ministering to help them see that it was a certain truth that they already had, that eternal life. In 1 John 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life, so that you know that you have eternal life. It is a present continuous tense. It's not a one-off gift, but an ongoing reality. And just being, just as being a child of God is a relationship that is eternal, so having this treasure within is something no one can take away. So, Here's the perspective that Paul is writing from, from which he can view all what happens in his few short years on earth. It's a perspective that enables him to declare to the Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's a perspective that enables him to persevere through all his troubles and hardships. It's the perspective which enables him to describe them as light and momentary afflictions in comparison to the treasure which God has given him in Christ. Life in all its fullness. And so we are invited to believe, as the English mystic all those centuries ago wrote Julian of Norwich, that at the end, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Because you're a child of God, because you have eternal life, all shall be well. So in the light of this profound truth, may we conclude by pausing to reflect on the things that we are going through now. It may be the things that are on your heart or the, some of the bigger things that are happening in the world or to individuals that are going through huge times of trial. It may be the things that in your own life that are particularly difficult and testing you to the full. It may be that you feel that darkness around which only the light of Christ can penetrate. And I want to pray and ponder out of the verses from Hebrews 12. And can I ask you just to, to close your eyes and maybe have in mind the things that you are feeling are particularly trying you at this time. The writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all those who have gone before, who have 
kept the faith and run the race. Lord, we thank you for them, that they are cheering us on, that their example and inspiration are there for us to rejoice in and take courage from. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Lord, would you come in your love and purify us again? Refine us and make our hearts ready to burn with love for you. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Lord, we want to run with perseverance at, because we are fixing our eyes on you. We can't run with perseverance just by our own effort. We can only do it, Lord, because you are at the center of our vision. Be thou my vision, Lord. You are the perfecter and pioneer of faith, the faith that sees the end at the beginning. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you, Lord. It was that same joy that filled you, that fills us when we see <coughs> the truth of what is to be. But you, King Jesus, are reigning in glory and always will. So, Lord, we consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that we might not grow weary or lose heart. Lord, make us to become people of perseverance who know we possess everything who know who we are and the treasure that we have in you. Amen. I'm just going to affirm that truth of who we are as we sing a song in response, just recognizing that those things that seek to hold us back the things that entangle us, the fears that make us feel we, we can't do this, we can't go on anymore. We want to recognize that it's being a child of God that enables us to persevere. Let's stand together. <clears throat>